You're listening to the Green Gorgeous Life podcast, episode number one, and today we're going to be talking with building biologist Martine Davis about what to do about the fact that 95% of homes and 60% of offices have some sort of environmental pollutant. Welcome to the Green Gorgeous Life podcast, where you can learn from other green babes how to live your green gorgeous life. We'll talk about wellness, green beauty, and natural lifestyle tips. I'm your host, Laura Ellers, wellness coach, YouTuber, and natural living enthusiast. For more information about today's episode, head to laurasnaturallife.com. And now on to the show. Guys, welcome to episode one of the Green Gorgeous Life podcast. Can you believe this is finally a thing? I am so excited and I hope you like it. So make sure that you give me your feedback on it, what you like and dislike so that I can make it the best that it can be. Anyways, I am so excited to bring you this interview. It's actually what made me decide I wanted to to try a podcast. I originally interviewed Martine for a course that I was creating, Toxin Free Transformation, which I'm sure you guys have heard about because I've been talking about it. But now that I've landed myself in the hospital, that course is kind of on hold. And after I talked to her, I was like, you know what? I can't keep this information private um, just for this course. Like I need, everybody needs to listen to this. I have hired Martine several times, as has my mother, and I still learned stuff from her in this podcast. So I don't think that you'll be disappointed. She's going to explain to you all about building biology so you understand that it's like way more specialized than just an air inspector and how to find somebody if you need a professional. Easy tips to keep your home toxin free. We're going to debunk some myths about mold and talk about mold and chemicals in your house. So buckle up, grab a tasty beverage because you are going to want to take some notes, I think. Anyways, on to the interview. So my first question for you is, what exactly does an air inspector do? Or are you different than a traditional air inspector? Um, Well, air quality inspection should encompass uh, several things. So I don't know if I'm different or not. I think I am just because I've heard other customers say they had an air quality test, but all that happened was a mold test. So I think that can happen in that way that for some companies, air quality means a mold test. Mm -hmm. Uh, But really, if you look at the definition of indoor air quality, it encompasses a lot of other factors. And so that would be, usually I break it down into three categories, particulates, and particulates are things that are floating in the air that you're breathing. So that could be anything from soot from candle burning or fireplace. It could be dander from uh, just household dust and pets. Uh, Could be actually allergens, you know, if you have mice in your walls. All those things that are floating in the air, fiberglass particles, and of course, mold is included in that. That's a particulate. Then the next section would be the gases, and gases could be formaldehyde or uh, natural gas, methane gas, sewer gas, Uh, and gases also can come from mold. So that's what's interesting about mold is mold is actually looked at from different angles because mold emit gas. And sometimes the mold spore is not what people are reacting to. They're actually reacting to the gas. I didn't know that. That's and, so interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting thing, too. That's something that a lot of people don't know. So the mold gas is that musty smell that you smell. Like you walk into a basement and it smells musty. Oh, and yeah. what that Yeah, what that smell is is a mold gas. And what we mean by mold gas is the same kind of gas that people emit. When we digest food, we have gas. And when molds eat food, which is usually like drywall paper or dust and carpeting, when they digest, they emit gas. And that's what that smell is. So basically, you know, to be crude about it, it's, it's actually like mold farts. <laughs> and 
And then the other category that we look at is the volatile compounds, which is going to be all your chemicals. And then there are semi-volatile compounds. So the VOCs are things like, let's say uh, you live near a highway or in a busy street, and we're going to look at your interior, and we're going to check for benzene, toluene, xylene, because those are the compounds that are emitted by car exhaust and car fumes. Uh, if you live near a dry cleaner, you know, we're going to look at another compound. If you look, if you, unfortunately for you, if you live near like a nail salon, you know, we would be looking for acetone and things like that in the air because they can be introduced in your air, in your house. Mm -hmm. So that's the volatiles. And then the semi-volatiles are things like pesticides, uh, plasticizers, they're basically another form of VOCs, but they're called semi-volatiles because they have a different um, mo mo molecular weight. So the weight of a compound has, an, has something to do with where you test. Like if I'm testing for benzene, I may test at a different level, a different height, you know, than if I'm testing for another compound. But I mean, that's getting very technical. So when we say air quality, we're looking at all of that, plus your temperature, your relative humidity, and your carbon dioxide, which is how much oxygen is available to you. And people that are chemically sensitive or people that have Lyme, for example, a lot of us, and I'm one of them, that I have chemical sensitivity, we need a little bit more oxygen than the next guy. So that's also important for your comfort if you're chemically sensitive, you don't want to have high carbon dioxide, which is a measurement. It's a surrogate measurement for oxygen. Any of this makes sense? Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I know you've been to my house um, and we've met several times, but I guess I didn't even realize all of the stuff that you were looking for. Um, <laughs> that's so cool. Right. Right. And, and unfortunately, all this stuff requires some lab testing and lab tests are expensive. So it's rare that a person can actually afford to say, Hey, I want the whole works. Sure. Because and if we do the whole works, you know, it can be over a thousand dollars. It's more like $1,200 where if we do the basics, we can keep it at five to 600. Yeah. And that's something that you can help with is like, I know when we talked originally a few years ago, you were able to recommend what labs would need to be done based on the things that I was telling you about um, my health. Exactly. My yeah. Very right. So usually the air quality inspection is the first 30 minutes is actually an intake to find out what the person's concerns are, what their symptoms might be. And, and then we focus on, okay, these symptoms probably wouldn't be coming from pesticides, for example, so we're not going to test for pesticides. Okay. And then to, then, then to make things worse, other things that can make people sick in a home are related to EMFs, which is not even anything to do with air quality. Mm -hmm. But as a building biologist, if I don't look at that, that I'm really doing a disservice because the fact that you're tossing and turning and not sleeping all night could be because of EMFs. So if I do just air quality, then I'm missing something. So it's really, you have to look at the whole gamut. For somebody to stay healthy in a home, there are a lot of factors. Definitely. Um, and it sounded like you got into this work um, because of your own experience with a home that was making you sick. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. So what happened is I was in my mid-40s. Uh, got a promotion. My husband got a promotion, so we needed to move, and we moved into a new house. And after 45 years of pretty much perfect health, I started to get sick and sicker and sicker and sicker and didn't know what was happening. But I knew it started when I moved into that house. So in the back of my head all along, I kept thinking, it's got to be something to the house. It's got to be something related to this house because I never had any of these symptoms before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, fast forward two and a half years later, I couldn't work anymore. I was so ill and figured out by going through some training 
in between bouts of illness, you know, I was able to attend a day here and a day there, tested my house and figured it out that it was the house indeed that was making me so sick. Wow. Isn't it so sad how, um, this is probably happening to so many more people and, and they never put it together and, you know, may just get sicker and sicker and not be able to do anything. And really it, it's just their house all along. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's also, you know, a couple of things that really amaze me about this whole topic is number one, there's a denial uh, going on, for example, and I think partly it has to do with the medical system because I have customers where I have found lots and lots of black mold. I mean, the toxic, really toxic molds. Mm -hmm. And I know deep in my heart, I know that's what made them sick. They've been sick for years. They can't work anymore. They lost their careers. And yet they continue to go to the doctor and look for an answer. Mm. It's like they don't believe that it could be the mold in the house. Um, The other thing that's interesting about that topic is in countries in Europe, for example, or Canada, where the government actually pays for your health care, the government has a program in place that if if you're sick and you're not recovering, they will go to your house and do an inspection of your house. No way. Yes. Yes. Oh, my gosh. That's amazing. Yeah. And there there are countries like that, Germany and Austria, Germany, you know, they have social medicine. Uh, If you have mold in your house, they will pay to get the mold professionally remediated because they don't want to be paying for your health care for the next 40 years because you got maimed by mold. Sure. Oh my gosh. I had no idea. That is really, really cool. And yeah, in Austria also, Austria, I went to a seminar and the Austrian clinic has doctors that go to your house to make sure that you're going to recover from your illness. They check for EMFs, they check for mold, and they make sure that your environment is conducive to healing. That is so incredible. Yeah, it's so cool. I just wish that we could get to that point here. Amen. That would be like truly revolutionary. Um, it would be. It would be. We got a long ways to go because in my job, I see, for example, tenants that rent an apartment. Mm-hmm. And if there's mold in the apartment, they call the state, they might call the health department, they might call the building inspector, and they're told to put bleach on it. This is how far we've got to go here. hmm I know, um, well, you also looked at an office building where I used to work in and it was kind of the same thing where we had a leak and I said, you guys have to fix that immediately. Um, but I was gone the next day and nobody followed up on it and they were like, oh, we just put some pills over it. And that didn't work. (laughs) Yes. And that was a situation where they ended up having mycotoxins from, not taking care of the water problem right away. Mm -hmm. And I talked to the landlord and the landlord was not interested in really learning much about it. No, I think they want to stay in the dark. Yeah. It's more convenient if you're a landlord because it costs a lot less to stay in the dark. Mm -hmm. And some people truly, truly believe that mold does not hurt anyone and it's just a fad and, it's just what people are talking about, but it's overrated. That's what I'm told a lot of times. Oh, mold is overrated. Oh, gosh. Until they get sick themselves, and then yeah. we'll, we'll see what that rating might be, huh? Totally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> what are the most common issues that you're seeing in homes? Is it, is it more of a mold category, EMFs, chemicals, or does it just totally depend on the home? Well, there are some problems that I find in almost every home. Um, almost every home has some, some kind of hidden mold that they didn't know about. Mm-hmm. And so that's always an interesting thing because you can take a, a home that looks pristine with no visible issues, very clean, and yet you might find mold. Um, for example, one of the hidden places that I find mold a lot of time is either – under the kitchen sink or under the bathroom vanity. Mm -hmm. Um, If there was ever a leak in that spot, 
the water runs down and it runs underneath the bottom of the cabinet. There's a space there that's about, you know, maybe five inches tall. And it's between the floor of the kitchen or the bathroom and the bottom of the cabinet itself. Mm -hmm. And this is not a removable piece. If you Mm -hmm. look under your cabinet, you'll see this is actually part of the cabinet. You can't take it off to see. So I find mold in there. And every time somebody's in the kitchen cooking or doing the dishes, they could be breathing in toxins from this mold, depending on if it's a toxic mold or not. Mm-hmm. You know, if it's just your garden variety of mold, it might not bother anything. But I've had houses where when I do the intake, I'll say, is there a room in particular that you feel worse in? And sometimes the woman will say, well, every time I come in the kitchen, I feel kind of dizzy. I, I feel lightheaded. I don't understand it. Mm-hmm. And then when they say that, of course, immediately I, I'm thinking I better check under the sink and I find mold there. Um, the other thing that's very common that people don't realize is I find gas leaks in almost every home, oh. either on, either on the fireplace, the gas fireplace or on the water heater or on the furnace or the gas stove. The more gas appliances you have, the more likely you're going to have a small gas leak and you don't smell it. Hmm. And then the third thing that I find that's really common that hurts people's health, in my opinion, uh, is the, the Wi-Fi stuff. Uh, people like the wireless, the convenience of wireless, but they don't realize these things have to be positioned in your house in a c- certain way and so many rooms away from your body. So if you do want to absolutely have a Wi-Fi router, then you can't have it next to you in your office. It's mm-hmm. got to be at least two rooms away so that the exposure of the pollution is you know, at least acceptable to your body. Totally. Because what that radiation does, the first thing it does really is it suppresses your immune system. Okay. And so then it's a cascading thing going on after that. If you've got Lyme, then you're, you're just going to feel like you're going to feel bad all the time. Mm-hmm. If, uh, if you've got allergies, your allergies are going to get worse. So no matter what your situation is, your immune system is going down. I mean, even strong men that think, oh, nothing bothers me, they start to get more cold. They start to pick up flus. When they're exposed to people, they can't fight it off. So they get more cold than flus every winter. And then now we're seeing people getting a lot of colds and flus in the summer. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And that's because possibly they're on their tablet all day, you know, and they don't realize it's emitting microwave radiation. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, how would somebody know if they had a problem in their house? Are there kind of telltale signs that people can watch out for? That's a good question. So the first question is, you know, do you feel better when you leave the house? I mean, that's pretty obvious stuff, logical stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, if, you know, you, you stay in the house all weekend, you're not feeling too good. Well, it could just be because you were lazy and ate chocolate all day, but it could also be because you were exposed to something more because you were in the house for two, three days. If you feel better when you leave and then you get that feeling again when you come back, you have to pay attention to your symptoms and you have to listen to your body. That's one way that you can tell. The other tell is any kind of odor. Odors are not normal. Uh, hiding odors with putting a bunch of plug-ins and burning fragrant candles Uh, that might make you feel better about your home, but that's not healthy. Number one, you're breathing all the chemicals from the, because those are chemicals that are in these candles and in the plug-ins. And number two, you're hiding an odor that needs to be diagnosed. I mean, you could have a mouse infestation getting worse and worse in the walls. You could have little chipmunks in the walls that are, um, you know, leaving droppings there. Mold might be growing on that. You could have bats. Uh, a lot of critters can cause allergies and odors. So any odor, even if it doesn't smell like mold, it can also be mold. I've had mold smell like vomit. I've had it smell Mm. like dirty diapers because mold gas, which we talked about, Mm -hmm. is going to be corresponding to what the mold is eating. And they're not always eating the same thing. So if they're eating plastic, uh, I had one time a nursing home where, the mold was eating the glue on the vinyl wallpaper. 
So oh. there was wallpaper that was glued onto the wall. The mold was growing behind the vinyl wallpaper, and it smelled like dirty diapers in this room. So the nursing home staff said, well, we can't have our nursing home smell like dirty diapers. That looks really bad when people come to visit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so and the mold was actually smelling like dirty diapers because it was eating this glue and in this glue was a certain chemical. And when they digested this chemical, it smelled odd. It didn't smell musty. Wow. So I think, you know, that's one way. If it, your, your house really should be neutral. And people like to use a lot of fragrances, but your house is going to be the most healthy when it's neutral. That means no odor mm -hmm. at all. That's the most healthy house. Awesome. How would somebody know that they need a professional like you and any tips for finding someone who's actually reputable? Yeah. So, well, it, you know, if you've got any, any symptoms that you think may be related to the house, sometimes, unfortunately, symptoms don't seem to be related to a house. Mm -hmm. Like if we're tired all, all the time, uh, we don't feel good or we, you know, we have allergies. We don't think that it could even be related to the house. A lot of times people, everybody is, you know, everybody is the same way. They always try to rationalize. And I did the same thing when I got sick in my house. At first I thought, well, you just moved. You were going like crazy for mm -hmm. two months, moving all your stuff from out of town uh, you're traveling a lot in the car, you were moving things. That's normal. And then I said, well, you know, you're also getting older now. You're in your forties. I was, I was always finding excuses mm -hmm. to excuse my being so tired and feeling like crap all the time until I realized I didn't realize until I left for a while, you know, I was gone for a week and a half and I thought, wait a minute, I'm starting to feel better. Mm -hmm. And that's when it dawned on me. Sometimes it's just hard to see that it could be the house. Um, and then the next step is finding the right person. And that's very difficult here in Wisconsin. If you're in California, no problem at all. They are all over that state. Uh, in Wisconsin, it's tough. So the first thing you would do is go to look for uh, a building biologist. And unfortunately, there are only about 30 of them in the whole United States and Canada. So, but th some of them will travel. Uh, you might be able to get one in Chicago. And then some of the building biologists have um, a specialty. Some of them only do EMFs and some of them do just air, air quality. Um, the other place to look for would be to look for a certified indoor environmental consultant. And those can be found on the website called acac.org. Okay. Um, that's a good website to look for people. And that website has mold remediators, but they also have indoor environmental consultants. And those are more likely to know how to do uh, air quality testing. The other thing that you can do is call labs um, and ask them for referrals for air quality. Because if you're going to get an air quality inspection, you want to avoid people that do nothing but mold because they're told they're going to check is mold. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I would do, if I'm out of town and there's nobody available, there are actually uh, ways that you can do this yourself now because a lot of the labs have developed ways that you can test your own house without a consultant. Of course, it helps to have a consultant guide you, like maybe do a phone consultation with somebody in California and have them guide you with the results, but you can do your own test. Oh, awesome. So there's, uh, yeah, there's a lab called Prism Analytical in Michigan. Okay. And they offer a homeowner test kit that you run for two hours. And they send you the little pump in the tube with the directions. It's very simple to do and you run that for two hours you send it back and then you get a report with all the VOCs the chemicals that are in your house mm -hmm. so for example if you had a garage that's attached to the house or you got a garage underneath your bedroom and you have symptoms you have maybe neurological symptoms you have dizziness you're not feeling well they you may discover that there's benzene coming into your bedroom from the garage for example and that test will detect that 
Hmm. Garages are very tricky because depending on the airflow of a house, you can get uh, the fumes from your gas can or your lawnmower or your snowblower. Those are all appliances that have uh, leaks, the tank leaks gas fumes in small amounts. And you'll notice that because if you go near it, it smells. Mm -hmm. And um, if you've got a certain airflow going on, if the garage is underneath, it's going to come up and it's going to come up and you're going to breathe it into your occupied space. So anyway, that prism analytical is a good test. Um, There are also companies and I'm I'm one of those companies, actually, that I do um, consulting all over the country and Canada and I guide people. I do the intake and I say, okay, let's do a mold test. I'm going to send you the equipment to do that. Let's do a VOC test. Let's do a mycotoxin test. Let's do a mold DNA test. Depending on what the situation is, you can find somebody like me that will guide you over the phone because if you think about it, you want to do a DNA mold test. That sounds complicated, but it's Mm -hmm. not. You just take a Swiffer cloth. (laughs) You go around the house, pick up dust with your Swiffer cloth, and you send that in the Ziploc bag. Oh, very simple, but really good information. Mm -hmm. Very cool. That's all. I didn't realize that uh, people could do it on their own and consult with a professional if they don't have one in their area. That's really helpful. Um, What about easy fixes that we could all be implementing in our homes to make it a little healthier? Uh, easy fixes. Well, it depends what you're doing now. I mean, one, one thing that you got to watch for is the fragrance. So fragrances bring a lot of chemicals into the home and they are detrimental to air quality generally, even though people think they Mm -hmm. are a good thing, they're actually detrimental. So the first thing I would do is replace the fragrances. So your laundry products should be fragrance free. Not, none of that stinky dry sheet stuff. Uh, that stuff is being breathed by the children, by people pretty much 24-7, I mean, especially children. You know, they go, go to bed and they're wear, wearing pajamas that have these chemicals on them. Mm-hmm. And then they're wearing those they're clothes during the day that have the same chemicals. So they're breathing them 24-7. And fragrance is an asthma trigger. So if you have a lot of fragrance in the home and you have children with asthma, that's going to just be detrimental to them. Um, so the, the laundry products, um, the candles, I'm not saying don't have any fragrances. If you really love fragrance, like I think a lot of people do, I'm one of them. I love fragrances, but I use a lot of essential oils and just a lot of mixtures of essential oils. But even with those, you have to remember that they emit VOCs also. Hmm. And so it's too much of a good thing can be bad, you know? Mm -hmm. So if you're going to be uh, diffusing fragrances like essential oils, you want to do it in moderation, you know, 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there. Don't let the thing run all day. Uh, The other thing that you can do that are easy fixes, it's not, it's easier said than done, but is keeping the dust down. Because dust is where all the nasty things are. That's where the mold spores are. If you've got a lot of dust, you're more likely to have mold growth if it gets humid. Like mm-hmm. a basement, basements are more likely to get damp, and then they also have more dust. So they're more likely to grow mold. So if you clean regularly with a good vacuum that doesn't leak, you're more likely to uh, avoid mold. And then the dust also has things like pesticides from outdoors. It has lead from the, from the, the road. Uh, you know, there's always some lead particles on roads, and that's picked up by tires, and it goes in your driveway, and then you walk in the house, and you're bringing it into your house. Mm-hmm. Um, so not wearing shoes in the house, if possible, is a good idea, leaving all the shoes at the door that prevents all these particles from coming into the house. Well, now I feel like I need to go vacuum and dust my whole house. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, same here. (laughs) That's why I said it's easier said than done. When you're busy, you know, you don't always have time to do the very, very thorough vacuuming. Yeah. Because vacuuming, people think think vacuuming is just vacuuming your floor. But when I say vacuuming, I mean vacuuming the TV screen, vacuuming 
your computer screen, your keyboard, okay. the surfaces, you know, like your, the, the nightstand next to your bed, that should be dust free because you're really close to that all night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the vacuum is really the best instrument because if you have a vacuum that doesn't leak, like one of those German or Swedish vacuums that absolutely keep all the dust in inside the bag and not leaking it outside, you know, out of the exhaust. Now you're keeping this dust away from your breathing zone. If you're using like a rag, then you're just basically relocating the dust. Sure. When you use a rag, you know, you're, the dust is all going to come off. It's going to be in the air for a while. And then a couple of days later, it'll be redeposited on another surface. Oh, yeah. I've, I've honestly, I've never thought to vacuum much more than like my couches and the floor. So definitely yes. going to be putting that on my to-do list very shortly. Yes. And usually if you take a really bright flashlight and you hold it parallel to a surface, like a TV screen or your nightstand, you would be appalled. I know I am. It's like, oh my God, I can't believe all this dust on there. And so part of it is because we do it wrong. You know, mm -hmm. we just mess with the dust. We, we, we wipe it and it goes in the air. We breathe it for a little bit and then it falls back down. Where the vacuum, a good vacuum, will not do that. It's going to get that dust once and for all. So you'll notice if you do the vacuuming of the surfaces that you actually have to vacuum less. Interesting. Over time because it's yeah. not, you know, you're not recycling the same dust over and over again. Yeah. And what about air purifiers? Do you think everybody should have one or not really? Well, if you live in a city or if you live out in the country where there's a lot of agricultural activity, then you probably should have one, especially if you open your windows. Mm -hmm. I think nowadays, I don't know, with the pollution that I see outdoors, I don't know how one could live without an air purifier. So the question is, you know, it, the question is more like, how many do I need rather than do I need one? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, the, yeah. It, like the very minimum, you want one in your bedroom, but you have to be careful about the EMFs because some of these uh, emit very high EMFs and some don't. And so you don't want it near too too close to you. Some people like the fact that it's making a little bit of noise. It helps them sleep. Yeah. But technically in the bedroom, you know, really at night, we should be pretty much EMF free. And so... Um, I mean, if we want to get really idealistic about that, if you think about all the, the factors with the EMFs, you know, if I go to the German uh, medical system and the Austrian medical system where they say to really heal at night, you need to have no electrical stuff in your room, in your bedroom. Mm. So if I look at that, then I can't really have an air purifier running in my bedroom, but I can run it all day and when I'm not in there. So that's cleaning the air while I'm not in there. And then at night, I turn everything off. Yeah. Is there a particular kind you like over others? Well, there are several brands that are good and it's really a matter of what people like and what people's sensitivities are. We have customers that can't tolerate certain ones. Uh, it depends what they use for adsorbing the chemicals and the particulates, like a HEPA filter, usually people are not going to be reacting to that. But people may react to charcoal or potassium permanganate. They have a lot of different mixtures that they put in there. Mm -hmm. Usually charcoal is the one that's the most uh, tolerated by people that are sensitive. Um, but there are a lot of brands that are good. I like uh, Air Pura, Pura I'm sorry, um, Austin Air, IQ Air, Faust. I, all of these are good. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, the thing you want to avoid is the new technology where they have UV lights, which could possibly generate ozone. Mm -hmm. Ozone is an asthma trigger. And uh, some people have gotten very sick from the ozone. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've had several customers actually were diagnosed with hypersensitivity pneumonitis or COPD. And really what it was, was they had this, these ozone lights in their furnace and they was just producing oh. too much ozone. Wow. Yeah. Um, so you want to avoid the photocatalytic uh, technology because that 
is a technology that is really being pushed right now by marketer, marketeers, but there are a lot of problems with that. First of all, it takes VOCs and it transforms them into what they say, quote unquote, uh, harmless compounds. However, a mm. lot of scientists don't believe these are harmless. Sure. And I don't believe they're harmless because my chemically sensitive customers do not tolerate these machines in their home. Interesting. So that tells me something is being emitted by those machines. And we at this point don't know what it is because nobody has put the funding to test it. And yeah. the people that sell those machines are not going to be paying to test. Definitely. It's, <laughs> it's too easy to say, well, this is the newest technology. It's, it was invented for NASA. This is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And so everybody's buying thousands of these and they don't know what they're buying. Right. So I, I still recommend at this point, until we have more, more evidence that these things are harmless, I still recommend the base fix, which is the charcoal and the HEPA together mm -hmm. in one filter. Now, I have a lot of people ask me, what is a good air purifier if you have mold? And my response is, an air purifier isn't going to do anything for mold. You have to get rid of the mold. It, Am I right, or is there an air purifier that will actually help with that? No, there's no air purifier that's going to be good for mold. The best that you can hope for if you have mold, let's say you're in an apartment and there's mold in the wall and the landlord won't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. uh, an air purifier is going to help some because as the mold gas is coming out and the mold, maybe the mold spores are coming out of the wall, we don't know for sure because a lot of times mold spores are not found outside of the wall. They're found only inside of the wall. Mm -hmm. However, we do know that the mycotoxins and the mold gases, which is what makes people sick, those yeah. are coming out of the wall. Okay, So that explains why you can have invisible mold and still be sick from mold. And it's coming out through the electrical outlets. It's coming underneath the baseboard. And these toxins are more like a vapor or a gas. And they can, they can definitely come out of the wall. So if you have a big charcoal filter, that may help because it will pick up some of the gases. Okay. But it's not going to completely solve the problem. Yeah. So it will be a little bit of a help. But another thing also that's a misnomer is people think for mold spores that they just need to get a HEPA filter. But if you think about it, the part of the mold that makes people sick is more the gas. So mm -hmm. you really need something to cover the gas. And that would be the charcoal. Sure. Now, also about mold, I get a lot of people asking me, how do I clean mold? And oftentimes they're specifically talking about in their shower. Um, and, and again, I say the same thing. Like you can't just put bleach over mold and that's not going to kill mold. Right, exactly. So the first thing is always with mold is, first thing people think about is I want to kill it. And the first thing they should think about is how do I stop it from growing? How do I avoid it in the first place? Mm -hmm. So in the shower, the number one mistake that people make is they take a shower they run the exhaust fan, possibly, maybe. You know, teenagers don't necessarily do that either. Yeah. But they'll run the exhaust fan, they get ready in there, and then they leave the bathroom and they turn everything off. Well, that's not enough. Uh, so the first thing that would really be helpful to prevent mold from growing is after a shower, the exhaust should run for at least 30 minutes, at least. And you can buy, actually, an exhaust fan that has a timer, Mm -hmm. There are some exhaust fans that actually turn on when the light comes on, so you can't take a shower without it on, which is ideal for teenagers and people that don't listen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, they don't have a choice. There's also um, a switch that you can buy that will run the exhaust fan for a determined amount of time, like 30 or 45 minutes after you turn the light off. So when you okay. leave, you turn your light off, but the fan stays on. Nice. So those are great tools to avoid the mold in the first place. Um, once you have the mold, then anything really to remove the mold is going to be preferable to spraying the mold. So, you know, scraping it. I use hydrogen peroxide because it has no fumes mm -hmm. and it's a good disinfectant. It doesn't have any odors, so it doesn't bother me. 
Um, there's also a non-toxic product by, it's by AFM Safe Coat, the people that make the non-toxic paint. They have a product for the bathroom that's a mold retardant. Okay. Um, and it works. It, it will actually prevent mold from growing back on your caulk for a while. But I mean, if you don't do the drying up that you need to do, you know, mold's going to grow. It's just, there's no magical product out there. And yeah, bleach is not helpful because you put bleach in a bathroom. That's a small room. You're breathing fumes. Uh, chlorine is an asthma trigger. Again, it's really detrimental to lungs. You don't want to be breathing it. Um, and it's not doing anything to prevent the mold from growing back. Yeah. So people associate that bleachy smell with clinging, but really, yeah. I mean, uh, no odor is what's clean. No Definitely. odor and no mold. <laughs> <laughs> um, and kind of to wrap us up here, do you think mold or chemicals are worse or does it just totally depend on the situation? As far as a ha what problem to have in the house? Yeah, I guess if there's a better problem to have, <laughs> is there a better problem to have? Yeah, there is not. Of course, they both, they're both really detrimental to health and they make you sick. Um, you know, it's a matter of what they're going to do to you. I mean, formaldehyde, for example, let's take formaldehyde. A lot of people have these laminate floors that they replace their carpeting. Now they have huge living room with laminate flooring and it emits formaldehyde like crazy. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the, the worst with that is going to be, you're going to have burning eyes, burning nose. You might feel like your chest feels oppressed. You can't breathe. Um, and that's not the end of it. I mean, it's a carcinogen. So it's possible 10, 10 years down the road, you'll get cancer, some kind of cancer from this formaldehyde that you've been breathing for years. Yeah. Now with the mold, um, you know, mold also emits mycotoxins, which are carcinogens. And some molds, the toxins that they emit are actually so poisonous that they use them for uh, warfare agent. Ooh. And, you know, if you, if you go to the CDC website and you look under mycotoxin trichosethenes, for example, it talks about biowarfare, what to do if we get exposed to that in in the war i mean this wow. is how poisonous it is and it debilitates the person's neurological system so some mycotoxins they basically depress your your brain so that you feel paralyzed to do anything about anything it's yeah. like having the worst blah day you know you you look around and you go like man i really need to do something about the small i really need to do something about the small but i can't i'm just paralyzed um so i mean i i wouldn't wish any of these on anybody yeah chemicals or mold i don't know that there's one better but the one thing that people don't understand is that mold can be worse than the chemical mm-hmm I, at least from my experience, and I've had both, um, yeah. and granted I was young yeah. when, when we had the mold issue, but, um, living in chemicals was certainly no treat, but I, no. but, um, I would prefer that to mold for a few reasons. Um, I, yeah. one that the, the treatments for the house were a little more straightforward. There was a little more troubleshooting and it was probably cheaper than having to remediate a mold situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it certainly wasn't fun. <laughs> no. And, um, well, yeah. And chemicals, the one thing that might be p more on the positive side for chemicals is that a really good air purifier, like an IQ Air Multigas GC, for example, that model has huge amounts of carbon mm -hmm. um, and it has potassium permanganate. So for formaldehyde, it's only going to be half good, but for other chemicals, it's excellent. So if you have like benzene coming in from your garage, you put a couple of these suckers in your living room and you're good to go in your living room. Where mm -hmm. with mold, you know, you could put as many air cleaners as you want in there. It's 
mold is just something it's it's completely different sure it's not necessarily going to be captured yeah so but yeah. that's comp- that's like comparing you know cancer of the bone versus cancer of the lung it's like which one's better right <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely Okay, well, thank you so much for giving us all that information, Martine. I know that I definitely learned something and I've even had you in person before. So I hope all of you guys also learned something and feel empowered to take action to make your home a little safer. Be sure to check out the show notes for links for Martine and also those various air inspector and building biologist search websites. And if you want to discuss this topic further, make sure that you are in the Create Your Green Gorgeous Life Facebook group. You can join by going to laurasnaturallife.com and clicking join the community or by searching Create Your Green Gorgeous Life on Facebook. Facebook. But also, if you wanted to leave me a rating in iTunes, that would totally make my day. So I hope that you guys are enjoying the beginning of this podcast. Let me know what kind of topics you would like to hear about, and we will talk in the next one.